Prose and Children Think. She was appointed Fellow at Clare College in 2000 and was elected Fellow of the Royal Society in 2010. She's also a scientist in residence at Rambert, the UK's flagship touring dance company. Clive is a fine art painter and writer and was elected a member of the Magician Circle in 2018. Clive's paintings have been frequently seen in London's Mayfair art galleries um, and his written work has appeared in print on numerous occasions, notably The Creatures of the Night, a story written and illustrated by Clive in 2008, and most recently, The Mustachio Quartet. Nikki and Clive are a dynamic duo integrating science, art and performing arts to explore the mind. Today, they will talk about the psychology of cognitive illusions, of why the mind is tricked. Now, before I hand over to Nikki and Clive, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, you can ask questions through the chat function at any time, um, but we'll save all questions until the end of the talk. Uh, we'll get through as many of them as possible before we finish. Uh, to make the most out of the presentations, we suggest that you put your settings onto speaker view and in side-by-side -side mode to see the speaker and the presentation slides at the same time. You can do this when um, the presentation slides are up. Um, there should be a button with three little dots at the top and you can set the side-by-side -side view. So I will hand over to Nikki and Clive for their presentation. Hi, good evening everybody. Good afternoon, in fact. What time is it? Oh, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Can you hear us? Can we be heard? Yes, I think we can be yes. heard. Okay, that's great. Great. Well, welcome everybody. It feels rather strange to be doing a presentation like this by Zoom rather than in person. We hope that you have such beautiful weather as we do and that you're also able to enjoy the gala event in your back garden. Yes, it's a gala day, so we should be outside, shouldn't we? And, and indeed we are. This is not a green screen behind us right now. This is reality. Yeah, it's our real garden. Reality is something that many of us aren't seeing so much of these days <laughs> because of the pandemic. But so, so we've been very daring to try and do a presentation on gala day outside in this beautiful English country garden. Okay, so we've got, a, we've got a, a little presentation for you this afternoon. It's slightly windy where we are, so um, enjoy the weather as much as we do as we give our presentation. Um, we're going to be talking to you today about what? What's the topic? About the psychology of cognitive illusions. I'm glad you told me that, Nikki, or else I might not have known. <laughs> or why the mind is tricked. Okay. Uh, let's do a share screen. Uh, Zoom thingy. Okay. So what we're going to talk about in our presentation today is what cognitive illusions or magic effects reveal about the psychology and the biology of the mind, not just perception, but also memory and our ability to travel mentally in time. That is to go back in the mind's eye to revisit our past experiences and reflect upon them and to explore places we've yet to visit and imagine what they will be like when the future finally arrives. Yes, and this whole process is not just about uh, experiential memory, uh, that is uh, the, the mind's record of what's been experienced, it's actually also about body memory. Uh, the magician, for example, uh, since we're using magicians as our exemplar today, the magician has to perform a complex choreography of the hands whenever, whenever they do any of their effects. In fact, let me show you something. For example, I, I show you nothing in my hands. If I wanted to, I could produce, for example, from, from nowhere at all, uh, a large coin that appears from, from nowhere. Uh, nowhere, literally, because it's not there. You can see it's not there. Although it's kind of only invisible at the moment. If I was to take that coin and blow on it, I think you can see in the next moment that the coin reappears from nowhere. So this is the kind of choreography that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the, the manner in which the moves are enacted and the order in which they occur are of vital to the effect taking place, the, the effect taking place in your mind, in fact. Now, to create uh, an effect like that convincingly, 
the magician and the dancer or whoever's doing some kind of complex choreography with their bodies need to trust their body memory and not just their mind. The two have to be synchronous and they have to be able to work together. But magic isn't only about memory and perception. It also illuminates important things about the theory of mind, our ability to think about what others might be thinking, both on the part of the audience and on the part of the magician. Yeah, uh, so we might ask ourselves, where does the, 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 the magic occur? And the answer is, it happens in the, the, the mind of the audience. Um, but, but why does it work? Why is the mind tricked whenever we produce uh, effects like these? Precisely because we use our mental time travel system and that allows us to revisit the past, think and reflect upon the present and travel into the future to go to places we can only ever go in the mind's eye. Now, the interesting thing about using this mental time travel is that we don't just stick to the facts. We often embellish what we see and fill in the gaps. It's not so much about precisely what happened, but rather the bits we found memorable. Which were the things we chose to treasure and cherish? The experiences we decided to keep? And how do we make sense of them within what we already know? The present has to be contextualized if it's to be believed. And we can kind of illustrate something of this uh, in the following clip. Now, we could have done this outside for you. Uh, can you actually move that forward? We could, have, we could have done this outside for you because it's a little bit windy. Uh, the chances are um, the cars would have blown away. So we've actually um, gone indoors momentarily in order to film this for you so that you can see this effect. So how is, uh, how is this kind of effect achieved? Let's, uh, the mind has to be contextualized if it's to believe. That's the last thing that Nicky said. Let's contextualize what you're about to see. So watch carefully. We have a situation here in which um, there's a number of cards which you're now looking at. Uh, there's an ace of hearts that goes just there like so. Uh, alongside the ace of hearts goes these other cards which are all jacks of hearts. They go underneath the jack of hearts area. Uh, here's the ace of spades. You can see the ace of spades just there. And these other cards are the ten of spades and they go directly underneath the ace of spades. So um, if we turn these bottom cards face down, you now know from what I've shown you that this is the red side and this is the black side. So if I pick up one card from each side, you know there's a black one on this side and a red one on this side. If I put these cards on the opposite sides like so, we now know that the pattern's been spoiled. And yet the cards are still still in the same place. It's curious, how, how did that happen? How is that possible? And of course, these cards are actually all red cards. I showed you that they were all red cards and they are indeed all red cards, believe me. There's, no gimmicks here, no, no gimmicks cards or anything like that, real cards. And on this side here, we also have the, the black cards, and they are only black cards here. So look, that's exactly the state of Now, if I take the top cards, I put one on one side and one on the other side, I've spoiled the pattern again, those cards are no longer pure. You know that there's a, as soon as I click my fingers, but watch, we arrive at a situation where the cards are still on the right side. Hmm, yes, how does that happen? We could take this further, I suppose. Look, if I wanted to, I could even move the packets to the wrong side. So, but as soon as I click my fingers, lo and behold, they're still on the right side. And even if I take them from the right side and I put them on the wrong side, as soon as I click my fingers, actually, they're still on the right side. This is very, very strange. If we go a little bit further here, let's put these cards on the wrong side, I might lay them down, and they're still on the right side. So, this is interesting. This should be playing with your perceptions. I could put them on the other wrong side, will I? I can't remember what I do. Oh yes, I do put them on the other side. So this messes everything up. And if you want to be careful, they're still on the right side. And the last one should be on the right side as well. But even openly, even with these last cards, you can see them, I put them on the other side. And I click my fingers, they're still on the right side. So thank you very much. So um, a little bit of uh, jiggery pokery going on there. So there's a natural tendency for you to want to know how that magic works. Uh, 
in a sense, when you do, when you do know how it works, you actually do lose the effects. The mind doesn't hold on to it anymore. Uh, the creative brain switches off. Uh, and, and if we follow this argument through, then knowing how the effect is achieved is unimportant to the effect that's actually created. Yeah, so the more interesting question is why it works not how it works, because that says something fascinating about some of the blind spots in what we see and the roadblocks in what we think. Unless, of course, you take it from another point of view. Uh, namely, how could you create the same effect using a different method? Well, already you've seen me uh, produce uh, some coins from absolutely nowhere. Um, nothing in my hands, as you can see, but as soon as I do this, a coin appears from nowhere, I could take this coin, and if I just uh, just take the coin very carefully, I, so in the next moment it has actually vanished. The coins have vanished, and yet I can pick up the atoms and the molecules, the quantum parts of this uh, piece of metal, and it does actually reappear from nowhere. So actually, you saw a coin appear, vanish, reappear, and then vanish again. Did I make it reappear a third time? I can't remember. Uh, I'm in somebody's garden this afternoon. I don't know what's going on. But the interesting thing here is that every time I did that effect, I used a different solution. Uh, it appeared in, in, in different ways. So the creative mind looks to expand, it, expand its awareness for the possible by searching for the blind spots in other people's thinking, uh, looking to find new solutions to how magic might work. And um, there you go. All right, so we so, want to go back on the PowerPoint. So what does magic reveal about the psychology of memory? And mental time travel. You need to read it. Can you do that? No. We're going to start with a little poignant saying, and we, we think it's one that really captures and captivates the imagination about what's special about human memory. You don't remember. What happened? Oh, yes. So, it, it, yes, so we do this, don't we? You start again. So, I, I missed out. So, what do you. You don't remember what happens. What you remember becomes what happens. Let's say that again, Clive, just to. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful a little it. phrase which in, encapsulates something very special about how our human thinking takes place. You don't remember what happened. What you remember becomes the thing that happened. And there are at least two reasons for this that we're going to elaborate on in this lecture, in this presentation. So the first is due to the reconstructive nature of memory. And this idea was first discovered by this chap here, Sir Frederick Bartlett. And actually he's the man that founded the psychology department in Cambridge. And to this day, the chair of the department is known as the 1931 chair in experimental psychology, reflecting the seminal work of Sir Frederick Bartlett. And in a year after he'd founded the department in 1932, he published a book called Remembering. And what he showed in his research, and this was for the first time that it was thought of about how memory works, was that people don't remember what actually happened each and every one of us will have a slightly different version of the story that we tell of what we think happened. So in his experiment, The War of the Ghosts, he told people a story and then he asked people to just write down, summarize in a paragraph what the story was about. And he found that every single subject had a slightly different version of the story. People chose to omit bits they found boring, embellish bits they found fascinating and just slightly tweak it. It wasn't that the stories were completely different. It was clear they'd all heard the same story, but they'd retold it through their own eyes. So this explains why the present has to be contextualized if it's to be believed. We take the information that we experience and we change it. We reformulate it to fit within the context of what makes sense to us. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why magic tricks, for example, work so well on us. Uh, the second reason that we're going to cite today, uh, there are more than this, of course, but second, one of the second main reasons is a thing that's called boundary extension. 
And our boundary extension is where we fill in the gaps that we didn't see and we embellish them with knowledge that we have obtained beforehand. Uh, and, and this is why the effect with the black and white playing cards worked for you. Now let's explain boundary extension a little bit to you. At the moment on the slides, you can see two images of dustbins in actual fact. It's the dustbins in one corner of this beautiful garden. This otherwise beautiful garden that we're in right now, it has this raw edge where there are dustbins in it, <laughs> like all gardens. Um, now, in, the, in, the, in this boundary test, um, you would be shown the image on the left-hand side of your screen, and you'd be shown it for about five or 10 seconds. Um, and for five or 10 seconds, you have a look at it and then the image disappears. And then you're going to be shown about 12 other images which look very, very similar. And you, you're asked to say, which was the one that you saw first? Now, most, most of us, most of us with uh, good thinking skills and good brains actually choose something that looks more like the picture on the right when we're asked what was the image that we first saw. And this is because our brain fills in information that we didn't have with expectation with expectation of what we think or should think is happening or should be happening. So for example, the dustbin lid that you can see on the left hand side, which isn't complete, we imagine that it must be complete and it is a full circle. And the same with the wickerwork, uh, the, um, the same with the fence. Um, though we can't see the top of the fence, we actually fill it in with detail that we imagine would explain what's happening in the image that we see. And of course, we do this when we're listening to a radio play, for example. Some of the best, best visuals you can see in a story are on a radio play where your mind actually fills in the missing detail with the things that you want to see, not the things that the cinematographer has given you to see. So this is boundary extension, where we fill in the edges of uh, an image with the information that we want to have. It's in, in the same way as when we look at a painting, for example. We imagine what happened a moment before, and we imagine what's going to happen next even though we're only seeing a snapshot of the activity. So we've talked about two things so far. The first is the reconstructive nature of memory. The idea that we don't remember precisely what happened, but we reinterpret it and make it our own. And in doing so, we change it slightly. And the second is boundary extension, that we fill in the missing gaps. But there is a third thing, and that is that it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards, as the White Queen told Alice in Lewis Carroll's epic novel. Now, let's unpack what we mean by this in two stages. Yes, let's start off, Nikki, by telling us what you mean by backwards. Well, it's certainly true that the mind struggles to think backwards to reverse engineer a complex sequence. That's why language is actually unintelligible when it's spoken backwards. And even if we just to simply do something like repeat the alphabet, but going from Z to A, we find it so much more difficult than going from A to Z. And in fact, psychologists capitalize on this because when they ask human subjects to do various tasks, and they want to prevent people rehearsing what they've just been told in the gap between being trained and being tested, asked to give an answer. They very often tell people to count back from 100 in sequences of seven. So the prospective brain hypothesis argues that experiential memory, the kind of memory we use when we mentally travel backwards and forwards in time, to think about the past and imagine the future. Evolved for the future, not for the past. So memory is more about the future than it is about the past. Now, at first, that sounds strange, but surely memory is a repository of what happened. But if you think about it, what's the point in remembering the past and storing all that information if you were never to use it again? What memory gives us is the ability to reflect on the past, to evaluate how it feels in the here and now, in the present, and to think about what the future might hold. And perhaps most importantly, using all that information about the past and the present to plan for the future. Um, Danielle, is our, is our performance all right? Have you got a good reception? 
ask if we got good reception coming through. Hi, sorry. Uh, so it's uh, the reception's okay. It's a bit laggy on the videos, but you are. Um, it's quite windy out there still. All right. Okay. So... I just want to get to make sure that we're coming through fairly okay. Yeah. But if right. you can shelter the microphone a little bit from the wind, I think that would be that would be good. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyway, to carry on, we just wanted to do a little sound check there to make sure that we're okay for for anybody that's watching. Um, what Nikki's saying here is um, essentially explains why memory works forwards and not backwards, why we think forwards and not backwards. Uh, thinking about the future and anticipating the future is great for scenario building, for anticipating what might happen in the future, and also for building alternative accounts of what that future that we're imagining might hold. Now, this ability to think into the future, this flexibility, uh, comes at a cost, namely that our memories um, are inaccurate and often subject to change. Uh, and what's more, this doesn't only affect how we view the past, uh, it also affects how we envisage the future. We think the future will be more like the present than it will ever really be. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Nikki's so clever, she said that all of that in one sentence. Uh, so essentially what we're saying here is that our vision of the future is temporally myopic. In other words, we have a kind of short-sightedness when we think about how the, how the future is going to unfold. Our, our thoughts of the future are constrained by our current emotions and desires. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can explore a couple of examples here. We said that we would, didn't we? Yeah. Well, first, we find it difficult to dissociate future motivational needs from current ones. So experiments show, for example, that when choosing food for tomorrow, we're influenced by what we want right now even though we thought we shouldn't be yeah and in addition our future decisions depend on our memory of what happened before uh, i often find myself wondering when i'm making a new decision you know i come up with a new solution to something which is much better than anything i've ever thought of before and i find myself thinking what was i thinking before when i thought that was a good idea so we can keep changing things around but this this might be quite a good time to actually move into a slightly different arena what about other animals? Because we can learn a lot about ourselves by looking at other species as well. What about other animals? Um, after all, at the very beginning, we did say animals, not just human, human beings, and we said minds as well, not just human minds. Uh, we didn't restrict ourselves to the human mind at all. Can some, this is an interesting question, I think, can some non-human animals think about the future? And this is um, Nikki's specialism. She knows so much about this stuff. Well, members of the crow family, and some of you may already know that they're called corvids, and this includes the ravens and jays and magpies and rooks and jackdaws. They're extremely good at remembering. Yeah, but are they temporally myopic in the way that we are? Are they sort of like short-sighted in time, thinking that their futures will be more like the present than they ever really will be, which is one of our big problems when we plan for the future? Well, that's right. And, and indeed, there are some reasons to believe that in some ways they are better at thinking about the future, at least in the short-term future, because they don't have the same problem of muddling up what the future self and the present self wants. So in one series of experiments, we gave the birds the opportunity to hide food. We call it caching from the French word caché to hide. And we gave the birds the opportunity to hide food in little ice cube trays that are depicted on this um, slide by this sort of rectangular graphic with the eight little cubes and they get to cache two foods, A and B, which they can then later find and or recover and eat. And the idea is that before they do this, they're pre-fed one of the two foods. So they either get lots of A to eat before they hide the foods, so caching A and B, and then they get the same food before they get to recover and eat that food. So they might be pre-fed A or pre-fed B. For simplicity, we're just showing you the version where they're pre-fed A. And obviously the prediction here is that having eaten lots of one food, like human beings, they're going to then want the other food. So if you've been pre-fed A, you're going to want B. If you've been pre-fed B, you're going to want A. So the prediction here is that you're going to continue 
eating and caching the non-prefed food type. So in this, in the case shown here, that's going to be B. But the interesting case is another group. So that one's called the same group because they're prefed the same food before caching and recovery. And then we've got a different group where they're prefed the other food at recovery than at caching. And now, of course, if they're stuck in the present, then they should do the same as the same group, continue eating and caching the non-prefed food. But if they can think about the future, the fact that at recovery, having been prefed B, it's A they want. And in fact, whilst they should continue eating the non-prefed food, they should switch to caching the prefed food. And that's exactly what they do. You can see the difference here, the different groups switch to caching the food that they don't want now, but they will want when they come to recover. And it's not because they've gone off the other food, they still show the preference for eating. And similarly, we've shown that the birds can also plan for breakfast the following morning. Shall I show the video? I'm a bit worried about the temperature. Yeah. Um, but we have a little bit of a problem with the computer heating up too much at the moment. It's, it's saying that we might go into snooze mode any moment. But we'll still carry on and see how well we can do. Okay. Yeah, share the video. It's good. But is this just another example of instinctive behaviour to survive the winter? Or is there something going on? It's a question that's greatly intrigued Professor Mickey Clayton. He studies Western scrub jays and another American corvid, renowned for its caching behavior. Nikki wanted to discover whether they could do more than just remember where they buried food in the past. If they can travel back in their mind's eye to think about the past, can they also travel forward in their mind's eye to think about the future? Can they imagine the future, if you like, can they plan ahead? To find out, Nikki created an experiment based on a very human annoyance, waking up to find that breakfast is off the menu. For six days, the birds were housed in this aviary, split into three zones. In the middle is the dining room, where the birds were fed during the day, and at either end are the bedrooms, where they were kept at night. But there's a twist. Kept overnight in this bedroom, the birds were served an early breakfast. But kept overnight in this one, they got no breakfast and went hungry until mid-morning. The birds experienced this daily routine for almost a week. We give them three lots of experiences of waking up in the hungry room and three lots of experiences of waking up in the room that serves breakfast. But the important point is that the birds themselves didn't know which room they'd end up in on any given day. But then Nikki changed the test. She allowed the birds to cache food in the evening before bedtime. She placed caching trays in both the hungry and breakfast rooms. The question was, where would they choose to store the food? Nikki wanted to know if the birds could use their past experience of the two different rooms and plan for the future, namely for breakfast time tomorrow. The results left no doubt. What we found is that the birds cache about five times as much in the hungry room as they cache in the breakfast room. They can imagine what they're going to need the following morning when they wake up hungry, so they can solve a problem before it's even happened. So what this experiment shows is that the birds can plan for the future. So the jay's caching behaviour is far more than mere instinct. They have a grasp of the past, but can also anticipate future need and crucially plan for it. This skill is very rare in the animal kingdom, and it's the fourth key ability needed to solve problems. It's called mental time travel. 
And that's what the results actually look like. As you can see, they cached far more food in the hungry room. Now, of course, humans can plan ahead too. But unlike the cool foods, we have an egocentric bias about the future. Namely, as we said earlier, we think the future will be more like the present than it will ever really be. And that what the future self will want will be what the present self wants right now. Okay, and I think we can show you a little bit of how that might work. Um, Um, okay, just trying to just alter something that we have going on here. Oh. oh, let's have a look and see what we can do here. I'm going to be right with you any moment. All right. If we do this, uh, we were going to try and do this on a different camera so that it makes it easier to see what's going on. But uh, this might be all right. But just to show you um, how the how uh, the mind actually perceives exactly what we're seeing. Look, if I wanted to do this, for example, I could actually produce a large coin from nowhere at all. This is a large, large silver coin, and I think you can see that there. Okay. If I wanted to, I could actually, in fact, probably produce a second coin. This coin represents the present, by the way. And this other one which has just arrived is now the future, okay? So we have the present and the future. Well, actually the future, because it's now arrived, becomes the present. So what was the present now becomes the past. So these coins are actually sort of shape-shifting in a sense as we go through, so past and present. And if there was a future, it would uh, probably look like this. Sort of nowhere at all. So three coins representing uh, the past, uh, the present, and of course the future has not yet arrived. That gives, that gives you something of, some, some idea of the illusory quality of actually what we're going through at the moment, how, how the moments that we're in right now are a kind of illusion, because there is no future. There's only the present and the past. Although in actual fact, if I was honest about it, I could actually show you that there is no past either. Everything that happens, happens in the present, in the moment that we find ourselves in right now. There is no past, there is no future, everything happens now. <clears throat> now, some people have said, well, that's not quite true because we have history books and we have films about the past, etc." But bear in mind, all of those things can only be viewed right now. So actually living is kind of sad in a sense because everything happens in the moment that we're in right now, or we were in a moment ago, but we're into the next one right now. Okay, it goes on like that. But don't worry about it because it's kind of interesting because there will be a new future coming along at the moment. From my, from my elbow, I think, uh, just from down here, if I look, can you see that? There's the new future, but because it's arrived, of course, it now becomes the present and what was the, future, the present disappears, it becomes the past. This is no camera tricks here. This is all happening right now in your space. Even the present is a kind of illusion. How can we know it's there? It isn't there, it's empty. When we, when, the closer we look at it, the less we see. And yet it is there. If I wanted to, this is, this is the present, this is the moment we try to analyze and contextualize the moments that we're in, and yet they fade away as we're looking. And yet we can pick up the atoms and the molecules, the quantum parts, we can look intensely at what's going on, and yet the coin appears from nowhere. Now, of course, if we were just living in the present, if we were to suddenly just open our eyes for the first time, and this is us being here, this moment becomes a kind of horror. We have to contextualize the living moment that we're in. And of course, we do that by listening to the past. We're listening to the past. Okay, and the past, of course, is always behind us. So look, there's the past. And we can actually use the past and the present to actually plan for our next futures. That's generally what we do. But look, this is how we do it. Past and the present, we contextualize them, and then we reach into the future, and we produce the future. But look what's happening here. The future actually looks very much like the present, and very much like the past. And commentators are now saying at this moment in time that the fact that we keep on inventing futures that look like our present is one of our big problems. We need new thinking. And of course, this is the backbone to much of the work that Nikki and I are doing. We're looking for new solutions to old problems, new ways of thinking, creativity in short. So to sum up the first part of our talk then, experiential memory, psychologists sometimes call it episodic memory, is not an accurate reflection of what happened, even though we often trick ourselves into thinking that it is. We don't remember what happened. 
And yet what we remember becomes what we think of as what actually happens, hence the little phrase we said at the beginning. We reconstruct our memories to fit in with what we know. That's the reconstructive nature of memory. And we fill in the missing gaps, what we call boundary extension, to make sense of our world, to make the present believable. Sorry, everyone, it looks like we've just lost them for a second there, so we'll try and get them back online. Sorry everyone for this. Uh, we're just trying to uh, get a hold of them and give them a ring so that we can uh, find out what's uh, what's happening. Um, and uh, yeah, we apologize for the um, quality of the sound with the wind as well. Um, we'll try and make sure when they get back on that they uh, can uh, do a little something to combat that. So just bear with us for two minutes. I think we're getting them back in a second. So again, sorry everybody for the um, delay. Uh, I think we managed to get hold of them to get them back on.
Right, I think we've got them back now as well. So um, I think they're just going inside. So hopefully the wind will um, do. Thank you um, for Christian for letting me know that we've done okay getting this back. I uh, really appreciate it. So um, we'll hand back over to them in a second once they're settled back in. Sorry about this. Oh God, what a technological world we live in. Okay, let's just wait for Nikki to come in. Danielle? Hi. Yep, I'm here. Yep. How can see you again? Uh, so we've had up to 60 people at, um, at some point. We've got around 55 at the moment. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for sticking with us and bearing with everything this yeah, morning. Sorry about uh, the technical glitch. It's uh, <laughs> one of those things. We're all going to get used to these, I think. I think Obviously technical not, not glitches are the, uh, uh, the way of the world at the moment. So. Oh, you're going to have to get one of those too. Just to remind everybody as well, if you have any questions about the presentation as they're going along, please feel free to post them in the chat and uh, we'll still get to the, as many as we can at the end. So. Hi, hi good afternoon everybody, we're, we're indoors now, this might be better, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Sorry, the computer overheated and just suddenly closed down on us. Where are we on the Let's see where we screen. were on the uh, PowerPoint. I don't know how to do it. Um, okay. So the problem is because it's shut down, we've got to yeah. go onto the desktop. Okay, let's see. Where is it on there? On there. That's the presentation. Yep. Take it past William James, the next thing. Okay. Next. Great. Okay. How do we get back to all right, we're ready to go, folks. Do you want to go on the on the, um, on the PowerPoint? Yeah. Share, share screen. There we go. So we've talked so far about what magic reveals about the curious ways in which memory works, that it's not an accurate reflection of what we remembered, and that many of the funny quirks about the way in which memory works that we reconstruct it and change it to make it our own, that we fill in the missing gaps, that we can't reverse engineer what happened accurately. It's all about the fact that memory evolved for the future, not for the past. But the second thing we want to talk about is what magic reveals about theory of mind. Oh yeah, that's right, theory of mind. Uh, theory of mind, of course, is the ability to think about what others are thinking, uh, realizing that they may have access to sources of information that we do not, uh, and, and vice versa. Uh, and psychologists have uh, identified three types of um, theory of mind. Uh, the first, Nikki, is perspective taking. Now, this is an understanding of another's perspective of what they can see. and what they cannot see. And this in turn has two levels. So level one perspective taking emerges when children are around the age of two. And this is where they understand that someone else can't see what they can see because that other person's view is obscured. So for example, there's a barrier in place that may, means you can see it, but the other person cannot. Level two perspective taking emerges later around two and a half to three years of age. And this is the ability to understand not only if someone else can see what we can see, but whether we can understand how they are seeing it, as shown in this classic little diagram here, of how their view might be changed by being in a different line of sight, for example. Yeah, the, the second uh, category of um, theory of mind, uh, be belief desire psychology, is thought to be cognitively challenging uh, and develops later in, in young children. And this refers to an understanding that others may differ from us in their uh, desires and beliefs. For example, that somebody else might like eggs, whereas I know I hate them. 
Now, young children find it hard to ascribe beliefs and desires to others until they're at least about four years of age. And it's not until they're about six even that they can choose what another wants if it's in conflict with what they want themselves. So that's the second stage of theory of mind, belief, desire, psychology, the first being perspective taking. But at the pinnacle of theory of mind is the ability to attribute knowledge. In other words, to have an understanding that another individual may interpret what they see, perspective taking, and what they desire and believe in quite a different way to us, because they know and think things we don't. And this ability of knowledge attribution starts to develop in young children when they reach about four years of age, but it continues to develop into adulthood. So that's uh, something about how we do it and our understanding of how we do it. But what of other animals? Well, these corvids, these members of the crow family that includes the jays and the ravens, go to great lengths to protect their hidden food caches from the beady eyes of others who might steal them. And this reveals some interesting things about perspective taking from an avian point of view. And here you can see some examples. So for example, the jays pictured here, these are scrub jays that live in California, use shade to degrade information, knowing that in places that others are difficult to see, they can be more secretive. They also remove information by caching behind barriers. They also use distance. The further away you hide things, the harder it is for others to see. They also keep track of which particular bird was watching and listening when. So actually they're even able to reduce acoustic acuity, being as quiet as a mouse when another can't see, but can hear a condition in which sound might reveal some interesting things that you might want best protected. Here's one of the kinds of experiments that we did just to give you a flavor for the sorts of things. So in this case, there's a, a bird that's hiding food, the cashier, it's hiding it in one of those Lego trays that we talked about earlier, these ice cube trays with Lego bricks around them. And it's hiding food in one tray in front of one observer. So we called it tray A in front of observer tray A, and then they're hiding food in a different tray in front of another observer. And then we ask what happens when they come to recover their caches at a later date, either when both trays are available in front of the first bird that watched A, the second bird that watched B, a naive individual, or in private. And we find that they use different types of cache protection tactics. If they're on their own when they come to recover the food, so there's no other birds watching, they, they eat about half the food and the rest of it, they rehide, they move to new places. We call it recaching. But if an observer is present, they only move the food that that observer saw them cache. A in the case of observer A and B in the case of observer B. And if a naive individual is watching who didn't see either caching event, they ignore the trays and do very little. But what's more, there's two types of recaching strategy. When they come to recover their food in private, they move items once to new places. When other individuals are watching, they tend to move them multiple times, usually in the original place in which it was cached, but they may move it as many as six times. And this is a bit like a magic effect. When they cache in private, you can see here, the worms are very clearly visible in the beak. And it's very easy to see on um, a camera attached above the cage where exactly they've cached the food and where they've moved it to. But when others are watching, they are much more secretive. They use sleight of beak, if you like. It's being moved, but you can't really tell when it was actually moved and when they just pretended to move it. And they also have secret pockets, in their case, a little pouch just under the beak in which they can hide the food. 
Perhaps most remarkable is the fact that these behaviours are not hardwired, they depend on experience. So it's only birds who themselves have been thieves in the past that do all these cash protection tactics, that do all these deceptive sleight of beak and secret pocket effects. Naive birds don't, they just don't move the caches at all. So in short, it takes a thief to know a thief. This is a form of theory of mind and was thought to be unique to human beings. It's a kind of experience projection of being able to imagine what others can see, even if you realise you don't quite look like that yourself. So COVID cognition reveals a number of biological bases to cognition, to perception and to perception prospection. These are all things that magicians capitalise on. However, when it comes to planning ahead and theory of mind, perhaps the big difference between humans and Corvids is that humans can plan for multiple outcomes and in multiple domains. And we can talk about them and we can write about them as well as demonstrating them non-verbally. We can play with our abilities in these areas to the point of entertainment. For example, a magician needs to be able to engage in multiple levels of perspective taking at the same time, knowing that their audiences will see things quite differently to the way that they need to be viewed by the magician. And using any one or even all of these three types of theory of mind at the same time, we are that cognitively clever that we can use multiple techniques concurrently to, um, to disarm um, the people who are watching us. But it's not just about perspective taking, however. For the magician, the magician knows that there are lots of different kinds of emotional responses to magical effects. And amongst the fraternity of magicians, Nikki and I know that there are at least three different types of people who watch magic. Uh, and magicians know of these three categories. There is, for example, the, the four-year-old. That's uh, anybody who delights in the naive. They see something which is entertaining and looks magical and they go, that's lovely, that's amazing. I really enjoy that. Don't tell me how you did it. They simply delight in what they've seen. Then there's a second category of person, uh, the scientist, if you like, and probably most of us here today are this category. We're fascinated what we're seeing, but we want to know how it works. Uh, and that's a, a very healthy approach as well. But believe me, there is a third category, the skeptic, who uh, is deeply troubled by what they see. They believe that they're being tricked and they don't like it. They don't like to have their sense of reality or normality uh, undermined in any way whatsoever. And they, and they resent it. Uh, and there are quite a lot of people in actual fact in this third category, strangely enough. Yeah, it's about 10% of the population in that third category. It's surprisingly high, isn't it, when you think about it? Now, as a species, humans are biased by our own egocentric view of the world. And it's not just time or presentism that the self has a problem is. As we explained earlier, we think the future self will be more like the present self than it will ever really be. But perhaps the more important point to emphasise at this point is that we also over ascribe to others our own beliefs, knowledge and perspectives. In other words, we do it for other selves as well as other times. And what's more, when we take another's perspective, we experience more interference from our own viewpoint when taking another's than the other way round. Uh, so, in essence, we're more likely to overestimate the similarities between what and how another person views the world compared to our own selves, rather than underestimate the similarity or overestimate the difference. And of course, magicians know this. So back to the beginning, we posed the question of why is the mind tripped by magic effects? Yeah, and we've managed to focus on two aspects of psychology that cognitive illusions reveal. Uh, the first one was that uh, experiential memories are flexible and, and, and forward-looking. Uh, they're also selective and subject to change, we said that. 
uh, we overemphasize the importance of the self in the present moment, uh, and this leads to errors in the uh, way in which we predict what our future self will want. And it's this egocentric bias that also leads to errors in theory of mind, as well as errors in what we remember. This egocentric bias also explains why magic is more powerful when it's personalised. Yeah, and we were going to show you a little effect right now um, between Nikki and myself, which you would have enjoyed, and we would have had to do that outside in actual fact. It's one of the reasons that we were outside. But we kind of realised that we might not be able to be outside for too long, and so we do have something in reserve. Can we show you the, a, a little clip of some films, which is magic happening in somebody else's hands? Let's show you this. Okay, here's an interesting situation. Um, magician has a card in their pocket. It's the King of Hearts. Uh, and you can see where the King of Hearts is, uh, even though it's moved around. Even when it's turned face down, you know where the King of Hearts is. Easy. It becomes more difficult if there are two cards, two cards. But when they're face down, you still can probably follow where the king is. I think you know where the king is. You're doing very well so far. But you've only got two eyes, and all of a sudden I've now got three cards. This makes it difficult. I can outmaneuver you because I have three cards and you only have two eyes. Now this is how it works. We're going to use the king of the main card, all right? The other two cards are just going to go around, protect the king, if you like. But look, if, if your hand was there and I was to give you the king right now, watch very carefully as soon as I click my fingers, actually. Uh, I have the king over here, and the card down here is the eight, strangely enough. Let's do it again. This time I'm going to keep the king. Watch carefully. I'm going to keep the king. I'm going to put my hand over here like so. As soon as I do a little flick, the interesting thing is you know where the king is, but yet actually I have the eight and the king is now over here. And the problem, of course, is that there are three cards and you've only got two eyes. Mm -hmm. So anyway, let's try oh, I should have kept the king really. I've got two eights there. So this is going to be hard to deceive you here because actually when I ask you whatever card it is, you're going to know what it is. It's going to be an eight. Um, but look, let me just wind these cards together. Where is the king? Well, actually, it should be there, but no, it's actually still here. Curiously enough, the king is uh, between the two cards. Let me put the king down there for a moment. So click my fingers, you know where the king is, except that actually that's an eight. So there's something irregular going on here because I'm cheating. I've got four cards. Oh, I shouldn't admit that, but there you go. Anyway, if I put one card down there, the king down there, uh, the other one in my pocket, now where's the king? If you're sensible, you're going to say it's in my pocket. But look, I can click my fingers and actually make sure it is in my hand. So in fact, I can make it so you know where the king is because look, I haven't even put it face down. But watch very carefully because actually it is actually two kings now. But the odd one out is the black card. Watch the black card. There it is. Um, I click my fingers and then immediately you see that actually all three cards, curious enough, somehow or other, in a strange kind of way, which is inexplicable, they are now all kings. Thank you very much. So I don't know what, how long this goes on for, but if these are the kings, it begs the question, where are the other cards? Well, they're in my pocket. And in actual fact, to do this very well, I have to have three, three black cards. So six cards in all to make that effect work. Now, the interesting thing is here, now magic when it happens in your hands is more amazing. Imagine I put those cards in your hands right now, the kings. Uh, I'm going to keep the eights as my cards because they're, they're the cards that I want to use. They're not such good cards. You've got the best cards. And you're going to put your other hand on top of the cards so that I can't get anywhere near them. That's the important thing. So just watch very carefully because I'm just going to take my cards. I'm going to, I love doing this a little bit. It's done for me mainly more than the audience. But look, watch very carefully. I'll show you my cards. They are now the kings and the cards that you were holding the whole time are now the eights. Thank you very much. Magic is much more powerful when it happens in your hands. Well, if this was a live performance, of course, we then say, well, isn't this the perfect opportunity for an applause cue? <laughs> but if you are interested in We're knowing... applauding you, for example. <laughs> we weren't applauding ourselves just then. We were applauding you for hanging on for this, yes. this long, despite all the gremlins and the problems that we've had in this lecture. Yes. Thank you for being with us so long. Thank you for staying with us and sorry the computer overheated. And if you are interested in knowing more about what we do, we have a blog site, thecapturedsort.com. We're very happy to take questions and we're also happy to um, answer emails at a later date, should you so wish. So thank you very much. And thank you, Danielle and Helen for, and Sophie for hosting us.
Thank you both. Uh, so we did have one question um, that came in through uh, that talk. Um, so uh, in reference to the human brain being myopic, could this be an explanation to why we aren't good with economics or other forecasts? Yes. Yes, basically, there are two kinds of biases that occur all the time. One is egocentric bias, and that is the assumption that we overvalue what the current self wants right now, rather than the future. And of course, it's influenced by the past, the fact that we don't remember what happened, but what we remember becomes what happened, means that what we think of as the past isn't actually what happened. So that warps our decisions for the future as well. And then the second one is something called confirmation bias, which is essentially that we see what we expect to see. And both of those things, overemphasizing what the current self wants now, and we only really see what we expect to see, as opposed to what's really going on out there, make effective forecasting and economic decisions pretty tricky. Yeah, we, we, we like the world to carry on the way that we expect it to carry on, which is why, for example, during the pandemic, so many people are suffering with mental problems because life has changed beyond recognition and the patterns that we grew up with, that we're used to, that we want to revert to because we feel comfortable with them, are, are now denied to us. And indeed, rather sometimes rather than accept the truth of the situation that we find ourselves in, we, we would prefer to bury our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening at all. Thank you. And uh, the person who asked that question said thank you for that answer as well and for addressing it. Um, so I'll just wait another um, minute to see if there's any more questions that uh, that come in. Um, but otherwise, uh, I think uh, thank you again, uh, Nikki and Clive, for that really um, brilliant presentation and thank you for sorting out your gremlins and moving inside uh, as well I think uh, that was yeah well we couldn't move into the house we we went we went in somebody's garden at the time and we couldn't get into the house because it was locked so we had to go next door <laughs> <laughs> that's not that, true that's going true. the extra mile <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've had uh, quite a lot of people just uh, writing in saying thank you for the presentation as well. But uh, oh, thank you everybody really nice. for joining us. Everybody um, be safe. Yes, yeah. stay safe and thank you for joining us and thank you for hosting us. Bye. Thank you. Um, so Bye. we'll we'll end there and uh, I hope people can uh, join some of the rest of the talks throughout the week. Uh, all the information's on our website. So bye everybody.